My brother Sam is dead. Chapter 11. Dr. Hobart saddled up and rode down to the tavern, and I walked back slowly. There wasn't any hurry now. Mostly I tried to put out of my mind what I'd seen. I went out to the barn and cleaned myself up as best I could, and then I went into the tap room. It was full of people who'd come to talk about the British raid. The wounded man was still alive. The ball had hit him high in his ribs and had stuck there without damaging him much. Dr. Hobart gave him a huge mug of rum, and when he drunk that down and it had had a chance to work, four men held the man down flat on a table while Dr. Hobart sliced open the wound and pulled the ball out with his forceps. A couple of broken ribs, he said, but they'll knit. He bound the man tightly, and we propped him up with some comforters in front of the fire and gave him some more rum and something to eat. He was pretty drunk, but he told us a story. Well, after the munitions stored in Dunbury, he said, Danbury, I came up here to warn the militia. We thought somebody might stop them, but I was too late. Dr. Hobart shook his head. A wasted errand, he said. The train band is pretty thin here. I know, the wounded man said, but we were expecting some Continental troops. You've heard of General Benedict Arnold, I expect? He and General Silliman and some others have been chasing the British up from Compo in Fairfield. They were hoping somebody would slow them down till they could catch up. Although I don't know what good it would do. They haven't got the men to take on that bunch of lobsterbacks. I took a deep breath. Sam was with Benedict Arnold, Arnold's troops, or at least he had been. Sir, you mean General Arnold's troops are coming through Reading? That was the plan. Of course, you can't ever tell what's going to happen in a war. Things change a lot. I knew it was foolish to believe that Sam might be with General Arnold's troops, but when you want something bad enough, you can't stop yourself from hoping. I wondered if Mother remembered that Sam was with Arnold. I didn't think she would. She wouldn't have paid any attention to something like that. I went to the window and looked out. It had clouded over and was beginning to rain. A man was running across the training ground. In a moment, I saw that it was Captain Betts. He came swiftly toward the tavern, opened the door, and came in. Stephen, somebody said, you escaped? They let some of us go, he said. Well, how many? Nine. They let most of us go. They only kept three. Is Jerry Sanford all right, sir? He shook his head. They kept him. Don't ask me why they kept a boy. They kept Jerry? What will they do with him, sir? I don't know, he said gruffly. What's happened here? Well, they've gone off north toward Danbury, somebody told him. They burnt Starr's house and killed some people there. Dan Starr? They killed Dan Starr? Yes. Captain Betts looked grim and hard. The bastards. We can still catch them. I'm going to get the train band out. We'll follow them through the fields and cut them down from behind the walls. Tim, go over and ring the church bell. Get cracking. I didn't want to do it, to get into it, but I had to obey. I started toward the door, but my mother grabbed my collar. No, no, she said, not my boy. You don't involve any more meekers in this terrible war. Send your own child out to play soldier if you want, Stephen Betts, but no more of mine. Betts stared at mother. Where's your patriotism, woman? Bah, patriotism. Your patriotism, is, patriotism has got my husband in prison and one of my children out there in the rain and the muck shooting people and likely to be dead any minute. And my business half ruined. Go sell your patriotism elsewhere. I've had enough of it. They're killing your neighbors, Susanna, Captain Betts shouted. They've killed Dan Starr. Then there's enough dead already. Tim, he started. Mother snatched up the poker from the fireplace. Leave my boy alone, Stephen Betts, she, she said. She raised the poker over her head, and I knew from the mad look in her eye she would hit Captain Betts if she had to. Mother, I said. The devil on you, Betts said. I can't fool with you any longer. Then he turned and strode out of the tavern, banging the door behind him. A few minutes later, the church bell began to toll the alarm. The people in the tavern began to leave. Some of them I knew belonged to the train band and were going off to get their weapons. A lot of the others just smelled trouble and wanted to get clear of it. Pretty soon, there were only a couple men left. The wounded man had fallen asleep by the fire. Outside, the wind had begun to blow the rain against the windows. Night was falling. Mother sat down at the table and put her head in her hands. Timothy, I want to pray. Come here and pray with me. She took my hand and pulled me down on the bench beside her. I put my head down. Oh, Lord, she said, please take this war f away from here. What have we done to endure this? Why must it go on so long? What have we done in thy sight to deserve this evil? She stopped, but there was no answer. And after a moment, she raised her eyes, got up, and began to slice some onions in the stew pot for supper. 
And an hour later, as I was getting hungry and wondering when supper would be ready, we heard distant sounds again, the sounds of marching men and horses trotting and orders being shouted. I looked at mother. The wounded man by the fire raised his eyes. They're coming back again, he said. Maybe it's the train band, I said, but my heart was pounding and I knew who I hoped it was. I ran out into the yard. It was nearly full dark and the rain spattered in squalls against my face. I looked down the Fairfield Road. It was hard to make out much, but indistinctly I could see a body of men coming toward us. I pulled back into the shadow of the house and watched them come up. After a while, I began to make out the shapes of the ones on horseback. I could tell by their hats they weren't redcoats. I darted back into the tavern. They're Continentals, I said. Thank God, the wounded man said. Mother and I went to the window. The troops marched by, then broke formation and began to spread out through the village looking for shelter from the rain. A lot of them went into the church or Mr. Heron's barn out behind. Then the tavern door banged open and four or five men stro strode in. Leading them was a general, wearing the long blue continental coat and cockaded hat with feathers in it. He said nothing to us, but dropped down at the table. The sides stood around him. The aides stood around him. Run for General Wooster, boy, one of the aides said. Then he looked at mother. You're the taverner, ma'am? Yes, sir. Uh, we'll need some dinner. There went my stew. But I didn't care. General David Wooster was head of the Connecticut militia. I had never seen a general up close before. And as I brought the rum and water, I looked him over. I was disappointed. He wasn't very glorious looking, just a tired old man who was worried and frowning. As I stared, he yawned and rubbed his eyes. Timothy, mother snapped, bring the gentlemen their dinners. Suddenly the wounded man began to struggle to his feet and saluted. Who are you, General Worcester said. Private Hodge, sir. I took a British ball this afternoon. They were here then, eh? Yes, sir, they've gone on toward Danbury about eight hours ago. General Worcester ran his hand across his eyes. Eight hours, he said softly, damn. He took his hand off his eyes. Sit down, sir, he said. Was there any attempt to made to stop them? The wounded man struggled to the floor. No, sir, not that I could see, sir. I stepped forward. Sir, uh, some of the train band fired at them from a house just on down the road. The redcoats killed them all and burned Starr's house. I remembered Ned's head jumping off his shoulders. How many men in the house, son? I don't know, sir. Maybe five or six. Suddenly, the door banged open again. Another Continental officer stood there, gazing around the room. Then he walked in, followed by his aides, and crossed the room to General Worcester. In a moment, I saw the insignia on his shoulder. He was a general, too. He walked over to General Worcester, followed by his aides. General Worcester got up. Ben, he said, it's good to see you. Boy, a glass of rum for Captain Arnold, General Arnold. So General Arnold was in Reading. I brought the rum and some water and some bread, and we scraped out the bottom of the stew pot to feed General Arnold and his aides. As they ate, they talked, and I stood back ready to serve and listened. They talked about routes and marching orders and other military things I didn't understand. Twice they mentioned William Heron in a friendly way. I thought that was strange, but I didn't worry about it much because I couldn't get it out of my mind that right there at the moment, Sam, that moment, Sam might be in Reading somewhere. But what was I going to do about it? Of course, he didn't know that father was gone and it worried me that he might be afraid to come home. Then there was the other side of it, which was that the chances were that Sam wasn't in General Arnold's troops anymore and probably was a hundred miles from Reading anyway. I knew I was being foolish, but I couldn't help myself. And after a bit, I said, Mother, I'd better go outside and see the livestock. All right, she said, but don't be long. I may need you to help with the gentleman here. I went through the kitchen, out to the barnyard, and then around to the front. It was so full dark, and the rain was spitting against me, soaking my face. Across the road, some troops stood in the church doorway, smoking pipes. I crossed over. A soldier barred my way. I'm looking for Sam Meeker, I said. Is he here? Who are you? I'm his brother, I said. You'd better get an order from an officer. My heart jumped. Is Sam here? You'd better go find an officer, he insisted. Another soldier turned to us. Don't make such a fuss, he said. Let him go. Uh, this is Tory country. I don't trust any of them. 
Oh, come on, the boy's not lying. Sam's from around here somewhere. I know that. Go get him yourself, then, the first soldier said. I don't want any part of it. Wait here, the other one said. I'll see if I can find Sam. He went in, leaving the church door open. I could see soldiers sprawled out in the pews and lying in the aisles trying to sleep. Some of them were drinking from canteens or chewing on hard loaves of bread. The ones who wanted to smoke had come to the door because it wasn't right to smoke in a church. They were, they were a ragged looking bunch of men, their clothing dirty and torn, and most of them not even having proper uniforms. They needed shaves and their hair was wild and uncombed. I saw the soldier work his way through the crowd looking around. I saw him bend down and touch somebody. And then Sam was coming up the aisle toward me. He looked older and raggedy too, and he hadn't shaved either. He got to the door. For a moment, we stared at each other. And then he put his arms around me and hugged me, and I hugged him back. Timmy, he said. I couldn't say anything. It felt so good to hug him, I began to cry. Then he began to cry too, and we stood there in the church door, hugging each other and crying all over ourselves. After a couple of minutes, we started feeling foolish crying that way in front of the soldiers, and we stopped hugging. I wanted to come over to see you, he said, but I didn't know if you all hated me. Hated you? I thought you might. Sam, father's... I know, he said. That's why I thought you might not want to see me. I didn't know what to do. How did you find out about father, I asked. Well, the commissary officers found out that I know about dealing in cattle. I've been working with them a lot looking for beef. And I met somebody from Salem who heard about what happened to Father. I think he got it from the Platts. He touched my shoulder. How's Mother? She's not mad at you either. None of us are. Oh, let's go over, he said. I haven't been home for two years. Where's the, how's the tavern? Who's in the tavern? The generals. And I'll have to stay in the barn. I'm not supposed to leave my company. Wait, I'll tell somebody uh, where I'm going just in case they want me. He went into the church. In a moment, he was back, and we ducked across the road through the rain and around behind the house to the barn. I lit a lantern. You've changed, Tim. I'm more of a grown-up now. I can see that. Has it been hard on you and Mother? Uh, we even have to work on Sundays, I said. Sam, what have they done with Father? He sucked in a mouthful of air. I don't know. Put him in prison, probably. But why? He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't a real Tory. He was just against the war. He was selling beef to the British. No, he wasn't. He was selling beef to Mr. Bogardus. He didn't care who bought it. Well, what difference does it make? It was getting to the British. It comes down to the same thing. He was selling beef to the enemy. Are you against Father Sam? No, but Father's against me. You ran away, I told him. He told me to leave. I didn't want to fight with him, but he threw me out cried when you left, I said. I know, you told me that before. Don't think I was happy about leaving. I felt terrible. I remember running down that road in the rain, being mad and cursing him for what he did. But all the while I was cursing, I kept remember thing, remembering things like our trips over to Verplank's Point and him taking me down to New Haven to get admitted to Yale and buying me new clothes there and everything else. And finally, I stopped cursing and I just felt terrible and I wished we hadn't fought. But it was too late. That's two years ago, Tim. Don't you feel bad about Father being in prison, Sam? Yes. He didn't say anything for a minute. As a matter of fact, I thought I might be able to get him out. I even went to see General Arnold about it, but I couldn't find out where he is. Nobody knows. Well, maybe you can try again. Tim, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm too tired. He was tired, all right. Well, can't you write somebody a letter? Tim, I don't want to argue about it anymore. I'll stop arguing if you promise to try to get Father out. I can't get him out. I tried. But you can try again, I said. For God's sake, Tim. I shut up. I didn't want to spoil it by having a fight. We stared at each other for a moment. Then he said, Can you get me something to eat? I'll tell Mother you're here. I slipped across the barnyard, through the kitchen, and into the tavern. The generals and their aides had finished eating and were drinking rum and water and talking over plans. Mother gave me a cross look. Where have you been? Well, there is uh, something wrong with old Prue's leg. I think you better come out and take a look at it. Uh, it'll, it'll have to wait, she said. I think you ought to look at it now, Mother. It wasn't like me to insist on anything that way, and she got the idea. All right, just a moment, she said. See if the gentlemen need more rum. 
I filled the glasses and helped her clear the plates. Then we went out through the kitchen into the barnyard. What's happened, Tim? Sam's in the barn. She stopped dead. Sam's here? That's where I've been, looking for him. I thought he might be here with General Arnold. She started to run, but then she thought better of it and walked steadily over there. When Sam saw her, he came a little way out of the barn shadows. For a moment, he and Mother stared at each other, then they began to hug. And I came up and put my arms around both of them and hugged them together. Then Mother pushed back and stared at him. I haven't seen you for two years, Sam, she said. He grinned. Do I look different? Dirtier, she said. He laughed. Is that all? No, older, she said. You've gotten older. Tim has too. I barely recognized him. He's had to grow up fast, Mother said. He didn't have much choice. I thought you'd all be mad at me, he said. I didn't know if you'd be speaking to me. Oh, we're willing to speak to you, all right, she said. We need you back home. Hey, Tim, I thought you were going to bring me something to eat. He was trying to change the subject. I forgot, I said. Tim, get your brother some bread and a piece of that ham that's hanging in the kitchen. I went back to the kitchen and got the food. I knew they were going to have an argument. When I got back to the barn, Mother was saying, Sam, we don't even know if he's alive. You have to come home now. We need you. That was the first time I'd ever heard her admit that Father might be dead. Sam winced. It hurt him. I, I don't think he's dead, Mother. I handed him the food. Oh, lovely, he said. Thanks. He tore off a piece of the ham with his teeth and then stuffed a hunk of bread into his mouth. I said, is that the way they eat it in the army? I knew it wasn't any going to do any good to argue with Sam. He wasn't going to change his mind. I didn't want Mother to have a fight with him. He swallowed. I guess we figure if we're lucky enough to have anything to eat, we don't care how we eat it. But Mother wouldn't give up. Sam, you have to come home. We need you. Your people have taken Father from us, and they'll have to give you us, give us you in return. Mother, I can't come home. That's desertion. They hang people for that. When is your enlistment up, anyway, Sam? He frowned. In two months, but I'm going to re-enlist. No, Sam, you have to come home. Mother, I said, don't argue with him. You can't make him change his mind. Well, he's just being stubborn, she said. God, Mother, I, I, he said, I come to pay a visit, and first Tim badgered me about father, and now you're badgering me about coming home? I can't come home until it's over. It's my duty to stay and fight. You have a duty to your family, too. Well, my duty to my country comes first. Now, please, everybody, stop arguing with me. And get killed in the meantime, he, she said. Maybe, he said. We were quiet for a moment. Then he said, we've made a promise, a group of us, not to quit until the redcoats are beaten. We've made a pledge to each other. Oh, Sam, that's a foolish promise. I said, Mother, stop arguing with him. You're both fools, she said. He was getting angry. For God's sake, Mother, people are out there dying for you. Well, they can stop dying, Mother said. I don't need anybody's death. Let him alone, Mother, I said. He isn't going to change his mind. We were silent, and I knew she was trying to accept it. All right, she said finally. All right. We changed the subject. We talked about the crops and about people, and he gave us a message to take to Betsy Reed. We'll probably be moving out soon, he said. I don't know. Tell her I'll try to see her if I can. He paused for a minute. I'd better go now before somebody misses me. He hugged Mother, and then he hugged me and turned and slipped through the rain and the night out of the barnyard. We watched him go, knowing that we might never see him again. Then we went back into the tavern. I had a funny feeling about seeing Sam. It wasn't just that he was more grown up or that I was more grown up. It was something else. For the first time in my life, I knew that Sam was wrong about something. I knew that I understood something better than he did. Oh, I used to argue with him before, but that was mostly just to show that I wasn't going to just agree with everything he said. But this time, I knew he was wrong. He was staying in the army because he wanted to stay in the army, not because of duty or anything else. He liked the excitement of it. Oh, I guessed he was miserable a lot of the time when he was cold and hungry and maybe being shot at, but still, he was part of something big. He felt, he thought that what he was doing was important. It felt good to be part of it, and I knew that was the real reason why he didn't want to come home. Knowing that about Sam gave me a funny feeling. I didn't feel like his little brother so much anymore. I felt more like his equal.